The American political system is overrun by money, the words of the Nobel Prize-winning economist Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who's visiting Australia at the moment. Among other things, Professor Stiglitz is a former chief economist of the World Bank. He's been highly critical of what he calls free market fundamentalism in economics and dismisses the idea that the profits of the wealthy will trickle down to the middle classes and the poor. He says the money that was meant to have trickled down has instead evaporated in the balmy climate of the Cayman Islands. He also blames much of the global financial crisis on deregulation of the financial markets. Professor Stiglitz was speaking in Canberra today. I asked him first about the federal government's recent bonfire of red tape and its promise to have more repeal days to get rid of regulation. Well, the issue is not whether you have too much or too little regulation, it's having the right regulation. And any government that says that they're going to burn up regulations is headed for doom. You need regulations to protect, to make our society function. Just think, i going to give you one example. Uh, you know, I come from New York City. If we didn't have stoplights to regulate who goes when, we would have massive gridlock. Our city couldn't function. You can think of stoplights as very simple regulations, but very effective regulations. If you don't have regulations that stop the banks from engaging in market manipulation, from engaging in, in all kinds of other bad practices, nobody will have confidence in, in capital markets, and the economy won't function as well. We saw what happened even when we, just, we had regulations, but we didn't effectively enforce them. Uh, and we've had the greatest crisis since the Great Depression. So in my mind, the issue should be, do we have the right regulations? And in some areas, like protecting the environment, making sure our banks don't engage in abusive practices, market manipulation, I actually think we need more regulations. But coming into Australia from outside, what do you think of our economy? Well, you've actually had, until now, remarkably good economic performance. I think uh, Australians may not fully appreciate that you are one of the economies that has actually delivered, that most citizens' incomes have have increased year after year. Uh, You have a minimum wage that is twice that of the United States. You are one of the few countries that are rich in natural resources, but have managed to invest those natural resources reinvest that in the economy and enable the economy to grow. You don't face this problem of a natural resource curse that so many other countries face. Don't you believe, though, that uh, it matters that that comes at the expense of of debt, of of what the government says is massive debt, and that it comes at the expense of deficits? When they say that, I I have to say this is laughable. Uh, Your debt-to-GDP ratio is 14%. The U.S. is 70%. Any Australian that talks about worrying about debt really has to be out of their mind. Even if there were debt, when I talk about the United States, much higher level of debt, the issue isn't debt. Every firm has debt. The real question is, how do you invest the money? If you borrow money to invest in your people, to invest in infrastructure, to invest uh, in technology, you have a stronger economy. If you don't make those investments, you really are jeopardizing your future. And there are concerns, as I look at Australia, there are concerns about underinvestment in infrastructure and in your, some of your cities. So I think the, the real issue for Australia is, are you making the investments that you really need to be the strong economy of the future that you could be? There is also a raging debate here about whether we are paying too much into our welfare sector. A good system of social protection, a good system that makes sure that every young person gets a good education uh, is absolutely essential to a well-performing economy. One of the real problems, the reasons the United States has not been performing as well as it should is that we've underinvested in education. What about I, welfare? It depends on how you structure welfare in general. Much of welfare, and I don't know the details of the Australian system, is going to help protect children and families. And that's your future. That's your future. In the United States, one out of four children live in poverty. Now, 
they didn't choose their pairings. And if we don't make sure they get adequate nutrition, adequate health care, adequate education, it will mean that our economy will, in the future, not be performing as well as it should. And we, we those investments in, in our families uh, pay off. It's very interesting. If you look around the world, what are the countries that have performed absolutely the best in terms of all the metrics, not only GDP, which is not a good metric, but the living standards of the people, the typical person, the person in the middle. It's the Scandinavian countries. And those countries have the strongest systems of social protection. But you say yourself in a recent essay that you acknowledge that everybody's sick of hearing about Norway, Denmark, and Finland. How do you get across that particular divide? And indeed, the sort of perception, which I gather means that you aren't speaking to any government ministers while you're here, the perception that you're views are left-wing and not to be listened to? Well, it's very interesting. There's been a major change in mindset about these issues. The IMF, which is not a radical organization, uh, has over and over again uh, emphasized that reducing inequality is important for economic performance. Countries with lower levels of inequality grow faster and are more stable. Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF, has been going around to country after country and emphasizing the importance of this. The IMF just pointed out that, argued that the U.S. should raise its minimum wage to help it, its economy recover. We've been languishing. Uh, our growth of the forecast for next year is two point, for this year is 2.2 percent. An increase in the minimum wage would actually strengthen our economy. Finally, just to go back to the United States, at the end of the 19th century, the robber barons were running wild, and eventually it took a Republican, Teddy Roosevelt, to bring in the antitrust laws that finally reined them in. Do you think that America is now capable of doing something like that, or do you think that this thing is running like wildfire? Well, the fact that there have been two episodes in our history where inequality grew to extremes, you mentioned one, the Golden Age, the other one was the Roaring Twenties, where inequality really had reached the level that it has reached once again. In both of those instances, we pulled back from the brink, we passed important legislation that made our economy more efficient, and brought us together, uh, reduced the level of inequality, uh, reduced the scope for rank-seeking, increased social protection, you know, protected the environment. What gives me pause under the current context is our politics. We have allowed money to have more influence in American politics. We have moved from a system that was, in principle, one person, one vote, to a system that is better described as one dollar, one vote. Ever you have the level of inequality that you have in the United States, unless you take strong actions, it's going to be translated into political inequality, and that's what's been happening. I hope we will be able to do what we did at the end of the Gilded Age, what we did in the 20s, but I'm not sure. Professor Joseph Stiglitz, and that was part of a wide-ranging interview which you can